I'm reading from the New King James Version, and our reading today is 1 Corinthians 13 to 10. 1 to 10. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have no love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and then understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, but I have no love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself or is not, it is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in equity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Praise God for his word, and I'll invite Wayne to come up and bring God's word to us. Good morning, it's great to be here. Um, seems like I haven't been here for a little while, but life's a blur for me, so um, it seems like yesterday. Just coming down in the car, I thought I, I really should address what's happening in the world. I don't know a lot about it, but I do know a lot about those types of things, obviously, from my past career. Um, um, and I should uh, speak to the church, but we've already done this before when we went through Luke chapter 13. Uh, Jesus is surrounded by multitudes of people, and he addresses this, this phenomenon of calamity. We live in a world where it's a sinful world and calamity occurs, death, disease, disaster, it happens. It's part of uh, a lost, fallen uh, world. And so Jesus said to the, the Jews, the Pharisees, of course, were trying to set him up, and he said, do you suppose those Galileans, you know, from up north that came down to Jerusalem that Pilate killed, do you suppose... Uh, their blood that was mingled with the sacrifices were more sinners than other people. In other words, they had this worldly philosophy that um, if you're more of a sinner, more bad things will happen to you. Okay, so a bit like the Buddhists. And then he said, um, what about that, that tower at Siloam that fell on, pe uh, fell on all those people and killed 18 people? Uh, do you suppose those people were more sinners than anybody else? And Jesus' answer to what those people was this. He's trying to get them to confront eternity. And he said this, Except ye likewise repent, you will all likewise perish. Except you likewise repent, whoever you are, you will all likewise perish. And there's never been a time... Uh, like today for the Christian church to just give a clear message to the world that except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's the message to the world. And the message is this, everybody dies. It could be sooner or at later. You have nil control over the timing of it or how it happens. Everybody dies. The answer is, except you repent you shall all likewise perish. And that's our message to the world. Uh, tragic as these things are, and as heartbreaking it is in, in, in the human realm, accept your repentance. That's our message. In a few uh, sermons time, when I come down here, I'm going to preach on Luke chapter 16, and I'm going to clearly say, as it clearly says, that everybody dies. And we all have these different lives, these beautiful people, these beautiful so-called innocent people. Um, 
and uh, some people have uh, political careers, some people have other careers, some people, it doesn't matter. We all have these different journeys. But once that point of death comes, there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. That's it. And so our message to the world should never, ever be watered down. It shouldn't be softened. It should be clear. We, uh, we have to confront people with the reality that you will die. And sometimes, look, I've been to... Linda and I, uh, my dear wife, who apologises, couldn't be here today, uh, just this last year, we have said to two people who knew they were dying of cancer, would you like for us to explain the gospel to you? And they said, oh, we'll just, uh, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. Both those people went into eternal hell. And they had the opportunity to repent, but they've perished. And we know that. And we know that's happening today. You, we had several people... Oh, by the way, I don't watch the news. I'm one of those people. I've had a gut full of it. <laughs> uh, so I know there's a tragedy, but I cannot stand all the, uh, the drama, that the news media. Sometimes I think they don't really care about the people they care about ratings or something. Um, so I, I can't... That, that irritates me, I must admit. Um, so I know it's a tragedy, and you and I both know there are thousands of people dying every day and going off into a Christless eternity. We know that. So what's the message? We have the message today. Uh, you know God, um, and you know the answer. And so we see that today in our passages in Cor uh, Corinthians. So we've been talking about love. And so I'd invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. And the reason I'm talking about this is I think it's been... Uh, misused by the church and I don't think the church really understands uh, completely what it means these days uh, they've got a sort of sentimental understanding of what the word love in the Bible means and I've made it clear to you that um, there, there's two main words um, in, the, in the Bible agave uh, and phileo And, okay, this one, this one here is where we get philanthropy, uh, hippophile, all those. You have a prefix or a suffix behind the word. It just means um, the, there's an object that uh, you're affectionate about. That's basically what it means. This one is the Christian word here. And this is the word uh, that we have to understand in order for this world to see what Christian love is really all about, which they do need. Unfortunately, people get uh, subdued by this one and they think it's uh, about affection. The love that the Bible, t listen clearly, the love that the Bible talks about, agape, um, is a love that is not dependent on the object to whom it loves, whether um, it feels well about that object or not. It just loves because it decides and wills and chooses to love. You are a Christian today because God chose to love you. He didn't feel good about you because you were what? An enemy of God. But he chose to love you and put his love upon you. And uh, I don't know what that does to you, but it does wonders to me. I love God because he, he first loved me. Let me read you. Uh, uh, 1 John 4, just... Hold this in your head. He that loveth not knoweth not God. So if you're a Christian today, you've been the, you've been the recipient of the <coughs> agape love of God. He chose to put his love upon you. And Romans 5 says, uh, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us as a gift. So Christians love because God loved them. And if you don't know love, uh, you don't know God. For love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God. You're born again because God loved you. That's huge. So we really under... And, and you say, okay, it's just a word. 
It's just a word. The kids are fine. They don't bother me. Uh, it's just a word. It's just a word. But we've been giving content to that word. And, and Paul gives content to that word. And he motivates us to understand what love means. He motivates it by saying, I don't care if I get up here with a fancy voice and, and jokes and, and I'm a, some, so, somehow a cool speaker or something like that. If I don't have love, Christian love, in my heart it is a, a zero. I could give all my goods to feed the poor. I could become a martyr. I could know all knowledge, all prophecy, all faith. Without love, it is nothing. And he had to say that to this Corinthian church because they were a church that had a lot of things going for them except love. And yet Paul still loved them. I'll prove that to you later. He still loved them because they were not... They were not worthy of love, just as we weren't for the love of God, but he still loved them. I'll, I'll show you later. Remind me if I don't. Uh, he still loved them. And so uh, we've been going, oh, I'll, I'll keep going with this. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. I love that. God loves me. And then he acted on that love because act, love doesn't seek its own. He came out of heaven's glory, came into the world, virgin born, lived and died and gave his life for my sins on the cross that I might live. And now today I'm really living. To, do you know the, the biggest change in your life is when you become a Christian. It's not when you physically die. You have the, if you're a Christian, you have the life of God in you now, and that's eternal. All right, to, to die, you just get rid of the shell. That's good news, really good news. In fact, if you're suffering and um, in, the, in the uncomfortable part of death and all that, it's really good news to get rid of that shell if you're a Christian. It's not if you're not. Okay, and then he says, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation. But love it, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And that's why I say to you, if there's one thing you do in the Christian church, you better make sure you love your Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. The problem with this Corinthian church was they were full of divisions and factions. Chapter 1, he just outlays it. He, he, I'll show you. He says, I gave, I gave you all knowledge. You, I, I spent 18 months with you people. <laughs> 18 months with you folk. And yet, I plead with you, brethren. Uh, he says in verse 7, you, you come behind, you, you have every single gift. And you eagerly awaited the revelation of the Lord Jesus, confirmed that you may be blameless. Um, I gave you everything I had for 18 months, and now in verse 10 he says, I plead with you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you speak the same thing, and there's no divisions among you. Okay, if he taught them properly, and by the way, you should be taught properly in the church, and one of the reasons there's divisions in the church is because... Um, uh, uh, human beings have got involved in the teaching instead of teaching accurately. People are believing all different types of things and that's where divisions come from, uh, particularly in this case. And that's why the, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians is so relevant today. And so they had divisions and he said, well, and, and what were the divisions? Oh, they were uh, personalities. I'm of a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. Paul's going, please... <laughs> Please, um, it's not the point. The point is we came to preach the gospel to you, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what I say to you today. If there's ever a time when we should be concentrating on what the gospel is and saying it clearly without fear or favour, it is today. Because we are the Corinthian church relive today. The church is all over the place um, it's worldly, uh, it's taken on the culture of the world, it wants to look like the world, it wants to sound like the world. But that's not the Christian church. 
the Christian church is the recipient of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tells us what the gospel is in chapter 15. He says, I'll declare to you the gospel. I'll declare to you the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day and he was witnessed by uh, the apostles. He was witnessed by 500. He was witnessed by others. And he's witnessed by you if you're a Christian through the eyes of faith. You believe that. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's very clear, you know. And, and Paul, just to make sure these people understand it, and I say it to this age today, uh, because I see, when I, when, I write, when I drive around and see these innocuous, silly signs outside churches, it, you know it drives me nuts. Why can't they put outside their church, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures? Why can't they put that? Is that too hard? <laughs> You've got to put one cross, four nails, equals four given, as though you're some wacky, trendy person or something. Uh, you know, although you know better than God. Can I say to you, he took two chapters saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world will be foolishness. So what are you going to do about it? Just preach it. We know how the world will receive. To the Greeks it's foolishness, to the Jews it's what? A stumbling stone. Oh, the Jews won't. It. You know, anyone know this ben, Sh ben Shapiro fellow, the Jew in America? Okay. He had John MacArthur sitting across from him explaining Isaiah 53 to him for at least an hour and he's still not a Christian. Why? A suffering saviour is a stumbling block to a Jew. And you see endless stuff on YouTube about um, how, you, you know the philosophy of the world. If you're going to get into the, you see all these um, sports people looking up and all that. What a fallacy. Uh, what a fallacy. You never see them looking down, do you? <laughs> um, what a fallacy. The, the whole philosophy of the world is that if you're good, like, like Jesus addressed the Galileans and all that and and the people in Jerusalem at that time, he's saying, you somehow think you're a better sinner than somebody else or you're better than somebody else. That's the philosophy of the world. Or if you're in a, if, 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 if you're in a gutter without any money and no food or something, somehow you're, uh, you, something, you must have done something bad. That's the philosophy of the world. Um, well, God, God clearly says... The world will never, ever know him apart from the revelation of the Holy Spirit into a person's life. He will reveal himself to a person through the teaching of the gospel. That's it. So just keep saying it clearer than ever. Don't water it down. Don't minimise it. Don't give sermonettes for Christianettes. Uh, uh, don't do memes, all this sort of things. Just the gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. You believe that, brother. You are saved. And eternity is, I'll tell you what happens to you when you face death. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in what? Love. Why? Because you know God. God is love. You know him. There is no fear in love. There's no fear in judgment. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has, fear has torment. Of course the world's in torment now. I wouldn't even want to watch the way this is all anal analysed in the next few days. I won't watch it. <laughs> um, we love him because he first loved. If I say I love God and hate my brother, etc., etc. All right. No man has seen God at any time. But what do the world see? They see us. They don't see Christ. They see Christians. Christians. So we better know what love is. The world needs to see love. And love is tough love. So when the gospel says Christ died for our sins, 
according to the scriptures, we better be hard on sin, not soft on sin. When I look around now and I see these like, like these signs around churches and look at bulletin boards and all, um, uh, you just get it by obs, obs, osmosis. I see the Christian church dealing with sin uh, with a feather duster. All right? When sin, you, should, you read clearly the Bible, what's the new covenant? You've got a stony heart like concrete. Sinner, you need a jackhammer. A jackhammer breaks up a stony heart to make it a heart of flesh. And that's the new life. I live through him because my sin has been broken. I've repented. I've turned from it. Turned to Christ. The jackhammer. Alrighty. That's my soapbox. So uh, we've been through. We need, we need to know this. I, I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, the thorough understanding of the love as mentioned in Corinthians is so important as a Christian witness. I walk around all, uh, you know, in my interaction with people all the day and I know there's a coldness and a hardness to the gospel of Christ. They've, the, Satan's done a great job on, on anaesthetizing people to even, that it's just a bunch of fairy tales. But don't change it. Don't try and be clever. Don't try and be witty. Christ died for your sins. Do you have a saviour? Have you got a saviour? Or are you trying to save yourself like everyone else? Uh, so, if I don't have this love, they won't see this love, and so I need to understand it. And we've patiently <laughs> gone right through all these 15 verbs in 1 Corinthians. The 15 verbs that if I don't have this, the world won't see Christ in me. And so I've, I've said to many people over the ages, because it was one of the valuable studies I did as a young fellow, uh, um, to pull me into line. And so I think you should learn them if you can. Uh, love is patient. I've, I've been through them all. I've got two to go. And then you're free. <laughs> we'll get to Luke 16. <laughs> okay, I've got two to go. Um, but love is patient. Just remind yourself, if... This is towards other people. I look at me, I look in the mirror, and when we get these 15 verbs, and they're like um, paint, paint on a palette of an artist, we put them on the canvas, we will have a picture of Jesus Christ, and I claim the name of Christ. I'm a Christian, so therefore I should be looking at this, I should be looking like this. Will I perfectly? No. Uh, but it's the ideal that I aim for as a Christian. I better be patient with people, long-suffering with people, very patient with people. Love, love is a long rope. It takes a lot for them to irritate me and upset me because I choose to love them. Number one. Love is, number two, love is kind. It, in the Phillips it says it looks for a way of being constructive. It just, uh, it's just not kind thoughts about someone. It's I will to be kind to somebody in the fact that I will look for a way of being uh, a constructive towards that person, not destructive towards that person, just as Christ did to me. Uh, number three, love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. Um, uh, jealousy is not a benign thing. Um, it's a bad thing. Love is the opposite of jealousy. And we went through all that. Uh, love does not boast. Um, if you find yourself telling people how great you are, I hope the Holy Spirit gets you as it gets me. I hope it does. Um, don't boast about yourself. You've got nothing to boast about. You're a saved individual if you're a Christian. What does God look for when he... When, you know, God in his wisdom, he chose to reveal himself through the Holy Spirit to not many noble, not many mighty, the base things of the world. So be comfortable with that. We're, we're saved <laughs> and we're very blessed because we're Christians don't boast I've written something down here that's good 
um, you know, you know, I, I'm in the art world a lot, and there's all about competitions and winning and losing and all that sort of stuff. And you have to keep a check on all that stuff all the time. Pride, pride is deception. We're talking about boasting here. Pride is deception. Oh, I'm this and I'm that. Um, since everything we have is from God. And it's, by the way, if you go home today, read 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5. You'll see it there. What do I have that I haven't been, what? Given. You've got talents, you've got gifts, you're in the church and you've got this and that. You were given that. That's what Corinthians says. Read chapter 12. You were given these things to act in the body. The body's to function properly. If you run around boasting as though you somehow weren't given it, it's a gift to you. Um, so, by the way, pride's the mother of all sin because it's, it's um, worship of self. So, and, and it comes out when you boast. And the next one is don't be arrogant or puffed up or vaunt yourself. Uh, what's that mean? It just means an inner attitude inside that you're somehow better than somebody else. And this can happen in all walks of life. Um, we, we just seem to have a, a, a world system that put, elevates people and puts others down. And it's just going on all the time. And it's really ugly because it's so unloving. And next one is love is not rude or doesn't behave itself unseemly. So if you've, if you've got some sort of habit that you've got and somebody chips you about it, change. Why? If you don't change, uh, you, you stand on your digs and you, you're, you're, you think you know better. Um, why do you want to run around in life deliberately annoying somebody else by some rude behaviour? That's unloving. Okay, and the key to all of this all these analogies is that love does not seek its own. And that's Jesus Christ on the cross. It's a picture of Christ on the cross. And all of these are a picture of Christ. But when Christ is hanging on the cross, he's seeking not his own. He's seeking my benefit. He's, he's, he's paying the price for my sin. He's imputing to me his righteousness and taking my sin and bearing that burden. Paying the punishment for it. Love seeketh not its own. Love, uh, next one is love is not provoked. Um, if you're a person that flies off the handle um, easily and people have to tread on eggshells around you uh, because you've got, a, you, 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 you've got a bad temper or something, uh, that may, just simply means you're not loving. Uh, so get rid of it. Um, you, you don't have rights, you have duties in life. You have a duty as a Christian to love. That simple. Um, next one is logosismai, which it simply means, and this is a good one, don't keep accounts on people. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ has washed away your sin and he doesn't keep an account of your evil anymore? And you are perfectly, you are declared perfectly righteous in his sight. wonderful if you find yourself saying i told you and i how many times do i have to tell you um uh, you know and you've got this big long list of the sins that people have done against you and you drag it up every time you get the opportunity uh the issue is not their sins the issue is your lack of love always always uh so love doesn't keep accounts on people. Love does have no joy in unrighteousness. Um, love is not calling evil good and good evil, just like Isaiah 5.20 says. We don't say to the homosexual community, uh, we love you and everything you're doing is okay. We say, no, we love you, but you're sinning. See the difference? We love them enough to call a sin a sin. We say to, I can't even hardly say the word transgender, it's so ridiculous this whole thing. <laughs> um, and it should be called out as ridiculous. Um, uh, no, you are not a woman, mate, you're a man. All right, I love you enough to tell you that. Don't ever shy away from that. I hope the prisons are full of Christians one day before I'm dead. 
I hope they're overloaded with Christians that stood their ground rather than these silly churches that are trying to condescend to all this type of silly, godless, sinful behaviour. It doesn't help anyone. Um, uh, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in the truth, God's truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. You hold to the Bible, you cling to the Bible, you cling to the moral standards of the Bible and you do not deviate a millimetre. God's, God's truth is true to all generations. Don't let this world... People often ask me, you say, well, what's up with the world? And I say, well, you de-God the world, that's what you get. You reap what you sow. You want to take God out of the world? And you want this transcendent moral um, uh, standard out of the world? You're left with your own standards all the time. And you're going to stuff it up. And as they are. Um, as I said in that little talk on Tuesday night, and I see it in the legal system because they had a bit to do with the legal system. It is just bogged down. And did I see somewhere they've got these hate crimes in Scotland or something? And that will just flood their courts with a whole lot of nonsense. It's so silly. Um, and you know what breaks my heart about Scotland? John Knox. John Knox. One of the greatest Christians who ever lived. Founded the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And if you went to Scotland today, there would be very, very few people even knew, would know who he was. What a tragedy. And whose fault's that? I, I believe the Christian Church, because it's lost its own message um, the through the ages. It looks more like the world today than uh, like a church. Okay, love bears all things and love believes all things. And we went through all that. And now the last two, love love hopes all things and and love endures all things. And then and then we'll get to this, get to that there. Uh, okay, so hopes all things. And I'll, I'll just be straight up front. This has to do with a fair few of you folk. I know your situations, I've been around you, you dear folk uh, quite a few years now and I know your family situations and so forth. But your Christians and some of your family members are not Christians. We all know that, all right? Love demands that you hope, okay? You never ever give up hope for those lost family members and so forth. Even when belief is shattered, when somebody's behaviour, they don't want to front up the church, they don't want to confess Christ, they don't want to, um, they don't want to repent of their lifestyle. Believe me, uh, the lost world, that's a hard heart. A sinful heart a hard heart. And a lot of them hard hearts sit in churches, I'll tell you. Even when belief is shattered that a person will turn their life around and repent, <clears throat> and it's all been shattered, Love demands that you hope that that person will repent. You hope that life will be turned around. You cannot give up hope because hope is love. Love is hope. That's what it looks like. They run out of faith and hope. If, if you run out of faith and belief and, and, and bearing, then you hang on to hope. As long as God's grace is, is, is operating in this world, there is still what? Hope. As long as there's God's grace here and it is, there is hope. Uh, failure is never final. Look at, I was reading, I read uh, uh, when Stephen was stoned to death uh, in Acts chapter 7, he was stoned to death. And, and who do you think was standing there minding the coats of those people? Paul, Saul, you think there's a hopeless case? And he was, he was full of murder and ever. He just, he wanted to kill all the Christians he could kill. So you never give up hope. Look at Peter. For the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. You know, never give up hope. Look at that beautiful epistle we studied there a couple of years ago. Oh, one and two. Ah. <clears throat> what a... What a transformation, because never give up hope. While ever God's grace is available, love demands that you hope. There's too many promises in the Bible to ever give up hope for another person. 
Um, and I have to watch this because as a preacher, I look at the church and you've heard me over the years many times. And I d from when I grew up as a little kid, you know I became a Christian when I was eight. In all those years, 72 now, so all those years I've seen the church just go down like that. What I once knew, the churches would have been full today when I was a kid. Sunday, Sunday schools running around with teachers here, there and everywhere. People hearing the gospel everywhere. But it's not like that now. There's a, there's a church that's uh, been totally worldly. It's trying to entertain people and, um, you know, trying to be like the world, to win the world. Don't do that. <laughs> All right? And so I have to look at that church and I say there has to be hope. And I, in my heart, I think there's no hope. But I can't do that because I'm a Christian and Christians love and they love with hope. So I hold on to hope. Maybe in my lifetime, and you see little snippets of good things. Uh, there's too many promises. Love can't take as final. Children that are lost. A spouse that is lost. Church members that we've once known. Hands up, those don't hand, put your hands up. We all know them. Church members that you thought were Christians and then they disappear and you find out they weren't Christians at all. Or church members that got caught up in sin and or something like that and then <clears throat> they're confronted with the sin and they don't repent and they're gone and all that. You can never, ever quite... You, you love demands that you deal with it, but you must never give up hope for that person. You can't, okay? Love is a long rope. It has no end. It can never lose hope in a person. Uh, it's a corny analogy, but think of a... I, I, I like dogs. Think of a faithful dog. They just sit and wait. <laughs> you just wait and hope. All right? And lastly, the last one of all these verbs... And by the way, let's clear this up. You cannot know love until you see it in action. So if you, that's why I say this, I've been through all this in great detail. I know if I'm loving by measuring myself against these verbs, verbs are doing words, they're not adjectives in the Greek, they are verbs. So here I measure myself against these verbs, are my actions equivalent to these verbs? And then I know whether I'm loving or not. So God's very, it's not just a word, love. It has actions. Um, and lastly, love endures. Okay, it's a military term, hupomino. It means to endure. It means this, you imagine um, uh, soldiers holding a position against all odds. That's what love does. So it never, ever gives up a position of love. It refuses because it will endure to the end. All the hardship, all the suffering. Think of all the sleepless nights you've had over your kids and your lost loved ones. Your mind just going like this. Okay? You must hold the position of love and never ever waver in that. Even against overwhelming opposition. And by the way, we will. If you, if you put your hand up for Christ in a faithful and true way, increasingly in this world you will have overwhelming opposition. You will. I just watched a little YouTube thing this morning. There's a, a black fella in America or Jesse or something. He just made a clear, clear stance on homosexuality and lesbianism. And the, that um, British fellow who big notes himself just cut him off, saying, I won't, have, I won't give a microphone to a person like that. And all these hate crimes, you think that's in Scotland, it's going to come here. That'll come here too. So if you put your hand up as a Christian and you're faithful and you say, I am going to love, I am going to hold that position, no matter what the, what the world throws at me, I refuse not to love. Love is tough. It endures. Even against overwhelming opposition, Stephen with rocks coming all over his head. And what a... What a Terrible way to kill a man. You know, some, you just put them in a pit and they throw, I think they're probably boulders like that, and they just one throws that way. And of course, they're all throwing. You can never get away from them all. Lay not this sin to their charge. 
endure to the end. Lord, he would not stop believing that they would believe one day, these people. And guess what? The one holding the coats, he did. He did. And look what he gave us. He gave us this letter for a start. What a wonderful thing. He knew, he knew what love was. Love bears the otherwise unbearable. It believes the otherwise unbelievable. It hopes the otherwise hopeless and it endures to the end. And there's nothing more after endurance because it is the climax of love. Now, just briefly, and I'll finish with this. Uh, when, when we were young, because of the Pentecostal movement and all that, we used to study this quite frequently. Um, <clears throat> so I never, <laughs> I never saw chapter 14 get studied when I was a kid, but as soon as the Pentecostal movement came around, it soon got studied. <laughs> um, okay, so if you've got chap what, chapter 13 open, uh, let's go. Love, verse 8. Love never fails. Great. So let's have love here. And I invite you to read the book carefully. Sometimes, what I do during the night, and I fall asleep always, but um, during the night, just put, I go to YouTube, you get on that Alexander Scorby fella, you know him? No? Yeah. He's really good, and he reads the Bible. He's got a beautiful voice, he, he, he reads the King James, the other boat reads uh, Niv, the British actor, and you just put it on and just... Let it go through your head, the scripture itself. But when, when, you, when you look at the overall book, you'll see that Paul is, is contrasting temporary things with permanent. And the permanent thing is love. That's how important it is. It's all these temporary things. that they were, The Corinthians, they were such a worldly church, they were getting caught up with all these temporary things that wouldn't last. And it was causing all sorts of problems with them. But the one thing that they needed to concentrate on to put all those things in their place was a permanent thing called love. God's love. And so that permanent, it goes into eternity, we'll see. Okay, so let's go. Uh, love never fails. Whether there be prophecies and, you, you know, that's just preaching... It can be predictive of the future, but it's, I'm doing it now. I'm prophesying now. I'm speaking before you. Uh, whether there be prophecies, they will fail. What's that mean? Not so permanent, is it? Yeah. Will I need to do this in heaven? Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, whether there be tongues. And what's tongues, language, the, the ability to speak in another language, supernaturally. Uh, they will cease, whether there be knowledge. Uh, what's happening to that? It will be done away. Okay, so uh, very quickly, I don't want to take much time. Um, uh, this one will stop just by itself. Nothing needs to happen, it'll just stop. It stopped in the apostolic age with the apostles. You want to argue? No. <laughs> okay, this one and this one, something will act on them. Oh, by the way, if people speak in tongues today, at best it's a psychological aberration, where, like hypnosis, like uh, rock crowds and something, you can get people to do anything if you want to. Uh, at worst it's demonic. Okay, uh, these, these two will have something act upon them to make them stop. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, see the temporary compared to this? Uh, in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is coming, boy, did we argue about that in years gone by. Uh, one bloke taught me it was the, it was the Bible that came, but it, that, that falls down. And the best way to understand that which is permanent is eternity. When eternity comes, when, I, when the eternal state, when I'm in glory with the Lord forever after the rapture, the millennium, all, all of that, and we're, we're, I'm loving, I'm loving belief. This is why you should love each other now per, as best you can because you're going to do it for all eternity. You'll do it perfectly because 
It's eternal. This will all be done. I won't have to do that. No one will. We'll no this will all be realised. This will, well, we'll keep going. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. That's a transition from adulthood, uh, from knowing nothing to knowing things. I, f I thought as a child, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, etc., etc. Verse 13, now abides faith, hope and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith. You know that beautiful song, My Faith Becomes. When I see Christ, I, it's been realised. I don't need that anymore. I'm seeing him. And that's fantastic for me because I'm a very visual person. <laughs> you know, and the, the, to me it's the most miraculous thing, this idea of faith, that I can, I can, I can see the reality of eternity. But I can't see it visually with my optics. But I will. So I won't need this faith part, will I? I won't need hope because, you, you know, Hebrews, um, which hope has gone before us into the veil. Okay, uh, Christ has gone into eternity. And then when I see Christ, he is my hope. It's all realised and actualised. But love... God is love. We just read it, didn't we? He, he is in essence love and that can never be done away with, ever. That's huge. And that's wonderful as well. It's a wonderful concept. So that's how important love is and it's everywhere in the Bible, absolutely everywhere. Uh, I'll leave you with one that I haven't shared with you. Oh, no, I promised and you had to remind me. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 16. I'll finish with this. Uh, Paul finishes his letter. And he says this. Uh, verse 22 of chapter 16, he says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be what? Accursed. Hmm. Then go to verse 24. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Now, there's two different Greek words for love there. And I'm not going to play a guessing game. Verse 22. If anyone does not phileo the Lord Jesus Christ. Have tender affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go up to anyone that calls himself a Christian and say to them, do you love the Lord Jesus? Do you really love the Lord? And you're talking tender affection. Is he deserving? Is he a deserving object of your tender affection is what that's saying. Of course he is. <laughs> We're the sinners. He's not. But here's Paul, he finished. Of course, he says, if somebody can't have this tender affection for this perfect being, of course they're accursed. However, when Paul finishes his letter, he says, My, oh, I don't have great memories of you people. In chapter 5, you've got someone having uh, sexual relations with their uh, stepmother, and also, it's just a mess. You've got these people going to court with this one, and I don't ten have tender affections, but man, I do have agape love to you. I will to be patient with you. I will to be kind with you, not jealous, blah, 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 not boasting, blah, 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 all the way through. I will to endure. I will to bear. I will to hope. I will to believe in you. And I'll come and see you again, which is what he wanted to do, but he sent Timothy. Okay, so I'm going to finish there with love. And I, I promised to do a whole sermon on showing you how loveless the world is now, but I don't have to with what happened yesterday, do I? Okay, we live in a very loveless world. It desperately needs to see Christian love. Desperately. And it's up to us. We, we, we should really ask the Lord to really help us to love the way he wants us to love this world.
Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Ah, oh, it's sharp and powerful, Father. Discerning, Father, the thoughts and intents of a person's heart. We can't hide our thoughts from you, Lord. We can't hide the intents of our heart from you. We just pray that we'll be open and honest before you. And Father, you'll teach us to love. We thank you. You've already gifted us with the love of God in our hearts. Let it show, Lord, to those around us, those closest to us and those afar. And we pray for your help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.